Welcome to Talk the Dog, the show where we find a bone to pick and a take to give. These are not hot takes. These is dog takes. Can I talk that dog? Let's shut up and grab some tape. We're live? Yeah. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome. Normally, I hear the click. I didn't, definitely did not hear the click today. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome in on a Tuesday evening. We do it every Tuesday, every Wednesday, hot right off the presser. We come running right out of the truck, and we give you our thoughts from the media availabilities. Um, but before we do that, as I was walking, I got to watch this. There's a little bit of delay here. As I was walking down the hill today, oh, yeah, we're good. It wasn't that much of one. As I was walking down the hill today, I'm looking outside, and I'm pulling the driveway, and I'm pulling the neighborhood, and it's already dark, and it's like 68 degrees, and it's kind of cool, and it's got a little bit of a nip in the air, right? And, and, and immediately, in my mind, okay, I don't know about you guys, but in my mind, when I, when I have these types of feelings or when I notice these types of sudden changes or what are sudden changes to me, I immediately think about a time where it's, I'm reminded of a place in life where I was when, I, when, when that was a special moment to me, right? And 62 degrees, dark early, right before the daylight savings time, early October, I'm going to tell you what, that was the time in rec football where you broke out the long sleeve. You put the long sleeve up underneath the shoulder pad in the jersey during practice and you, and you really got to cook and bake up underneath that shoulder pad. I'm telling you right now, I, and this is going to be the direct separation between our audience members who have listened to this or have played football and who have not played football. The very moment you are able to put sleeves underneath a shoulder pad and slide it down and put your arms, th- I, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it to you, other than it is the greatest relief in the world, okay? Because you don't get to wear sleeves during games, you only get to wear sleeves during practice. And nowadays, this time of the year, it is that time. You got a wicked smile on your face because I, I heard you when I, when I teased this to you earlier in the show. You, you gave me a mmm, thank you, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, first mmm, thank you, I got out of you in a minute. That's, a, that's probably the best time. It gets a little colder for me. You yeah. got to get to about low 50s before I start putting the sleeves on. But no, you're exactly right. That feeling when they slide, whatever it is, when they slide over. Oh, yeah. I that, don't know that what it is. That crisp slide. And then once you take them off, the rest of your body is warm, except for where you had the pads on. Stink. And that's the only place you've sweat. You so like this shit. is like, you're, you're kind of warm. You're kind of high after practice. And you immediately get this sense of cold. I, I, do you have any other thought, like anything that other than, other than like, I just gave you an example of fall weather right before the time zone change makes me think of football. Is there anything else you can correlate to a moment or a time in your life that, yeah, I mean, with regards to weather or anything? Another one that makes me think of football is when you first walk outside and the air just mm. smells different. We had mm. this conversation yeah, on the way over here one day. You can smell the fall air where it's not, it's, I can't describe it, but you can, it's almost like the leaves. Mm. Yeah. Like you smell the leaves on the ground, you hear them rustling in the yeah. wind. That's when you're like, ah. Like the feel the of best that time of year is first here. cool, crisp air. Like something about There's it. There's a like, constant football. leaf fall in the city of Athens, isn't there? This time of year. Yeah. Like you can bad. just stand outside or walk anywhere and you're constantly get, seeing a leaf fall off a mm-hmm. tree. I think that's one thing that makes Athens so pretty is all of the foliage. Yeah. Um, year round, green, this time of the year, fall colors. All that great stuff. Springtime? Ooh, how about it? But no, that always reminds me of like that first sleeve. That first sleeve at practice, my football folks watching and listening to this, they're going to be like, mm, that boy hitting right now. He, he talking that sauce. Now, the other random thought I had today while I was driving downtown and driving down Millage, and I love in my life when I can judge other people for their public displays of whether or not they're a good person. Okay, and here's what I mean by that. This is a prime example of if I catch you out in the wild, all right, and I'm observing you, I can kind of tell whether or not you are a good person. And I, and here's, here, I think you will agree with me on this test here, okay? We're at a four-way stoplight. Everybody got me? I need, you, I need your attention here. We're at a four-way stoplight. The light is red. The first car at the light is turning right, okay? He wants to, or he or she wants to proceed upon their route. However, in the city, there are walkways, right? We have the little white walkman on the street light. The people walking across the street have the right-of-way. We all know this. Now, 
Here is the test of humanity. Here is the test of your decency. If you are that person, guys, walking across the street and you notice the car is trying to take a right, what do you do? Do a little speed walk. You, you pick up the am pace, I, am right? Am I already in the street? or? Yeah, you're in the street. You notice that the person is taking a right. What do you do? Oh, I'll just give them like a little like thank you and then just walk. Yeah. You don't pick up the pace? Not really. Ooh, I'm about to judge you right now. Okay, so here's the deal. Okay, I, I, I think honestly, if you notice the car, a wave's nice and everything. But if the car is like e inching into the, the, the roadway and wanting to go, I need a little pep in the step. Give me a little something. If you notice that the car is obviously turning, and you're especially if they're like waiting for you to get all the way through the intersection, come on, give me, give me a little hop. You know what I'm saying? Give me a little pep in the step. I think maybe you're not a bad person if you don't do it, but you're not a great person. I compare it to when you're like in traffic and one person's trying to merge onto the traffic and like you and another car obviously make eye contact. Yeah. Like, hey, I need to get in here. Yeah. And they just drive past you and don't mm. even give you a look or nothing. Just like, ooh. You're a bad person. You're one car ahead of me. That's See, it. See, I'm a, I'm a give one, take one guy. Yeah. Right? If the person in front of you done gave one, then, hey, maybe you take one. You know what I'm saying? Whatever it, whatever it necessarily may be. But, you know, that's, that's one thing I noticed. You know, I, I used to live on the northwest side of Atlanta. And things are real hectic out there. It's like traffic's crazy. People are a little bit high strung and a little bit wild. And I used to live in a neighborhood. You saw it, Jay. Well, I think you mm -hmm. drove over there. Yeah. Where people were parking on the street all of the t all the time. Yeah. Always parking on the street. So when you drive and, and you're on the right side of the road, someone's on the left side of the road, y'all clearly have to take a turn going around the car that's parked on the street. Not at, not at Woodstock, where I used to live. People would just go. If they had the right of way, it was just, I'm blowing through. Oh, yeah. If we hit, we hit. Right? The first thing I noticed when I moved over here was traffic patterns were different. People were, for lack of a better term, decent. People were normal human beings. So, ladies and gentlemen, if I catch you out in Athens or any city walking through the streetway, you included, Kirby, and you notice someone's trying to take a right, just give me a little pep in the step. Also, if you're at a gas station or if you're at a building or whatever, someone's trying to hold the door for you and you're a couple steps away from the door, hey, a little hop. A little hop and a thank you. That's it. A little hop and a thank you. That's all that is required. Now, welcome in, ladies and gentlemen. Hit that thumbs up button, like, subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff. Let's get into the actual good stuff, which is the hot off the presser. Good information for you guys here. First of all, first and foremost, uh, I wanted to know, hey, 11 a.m. local kick, what y'all finna do yeah. Saturday morning to get ready for that football game? Because, woof, running my head through a brick wall at 11 a.m., I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready for that. Um, I have decided that I'm going to do nighttime content the rest of my life because when I wake up at 7.30, 8 o'clock, I am not very functional. However, um, how are they doing it? Steak and eggs, local time, 7 a.m. Nice. My question to you boys, steak and eggs, 7 a.m.? A little heavy, right? Mm. You hammering a steak. You hammering a nine-ounce steak and, and some scrambles? I mean, definitely not nine ounces, no. I mean, if, come on. What, what do you... A steak and eggs is a little heavy at 7 a.m. is all I'm trying I mean, to say. I mean, for me, I'm definitely a later breakfast type of guy. Like, mm. if I am going to eat breakfast, it's going to be – I've had some time in the morning to already wake up a little bit. And then if it's like 8.45, 9 o'clock. Yeah, definitely more yeah. of a brunch guy than a pure breakfast guy at 7 a.m. I'm not even going to get into my breakfast routine because you'll judge yeah. me. Probably just eating shredded chicken. No. No. No, chicken's not till later. In the no, that was my first takeaway. Is like, man's man's really out here serving up steak and eggs at seven o'clock in the morning, um, and I'm trying to figure out: Are you saucing that up? Are we are we putting ketchup on the eggs? <gasps> um, you know, all that what? Ketchup on the eggs? Ketchup on the eggs? Yeah, I'm a ketchup on the eggs guy. I'm a hot sauce. Hot guy. sauce. If you're gonna put anything on eggs, it should be hot sauce. Try me on or on, salsa. On the you ever had just, salsa? Just, just eggs? try me. I've tried it. It's yeah. It's all right. Okay, it's mid for you. Well, I, I enjoy it, so I'm there with it. Um. I, I want to play this clip for you guys. I, I, we were asked, or he was asked last week about Andrew, you know, his, his uh, y youngest son, Andrew? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Andrew's His youngest. youngest son being interested in potentially playing football. It stoked my curiosity, like, hey, this guy of all guys would probably know the recruiting process maybe better than anybody. Um, and he's got a son that may potentially want to play college football. Um, so I thought I'd pick his brain on, hey, if you're a parent out here in the world, so if you're a parent listening to today's broadcast and you have a young uh, athlete in any sport, really, I think this is uh, applicable to just about anybody, um, not just football. Uh, how, how do you go about creating and maximizes, maximizing the talent uh, of your young athlete that wants to potentially play a sport? I thought this was good stuff. Coach, last week when we talked to you, you mentioned Andrew's interest in football. 
doesn't have to necessarily be Andrew, but in general, if your child wants to maximize their potential in the football world, how do you go about approaching that as a parent? Um, depends on the age. You know, if we're talking about a six-year-old, I don't know that, that, that we're going to get there that age. If we're talking about a 14-year-old, he better be well into it and, um, and like contact and like uh, the toughness it requires to play the sport. So I think there's stages um, and development, and there's a lot of places in the state of Georgia that have unbelievable youth football programs, and uh, that's usually a good sign for us because they develop talent, and kids choose to stay in football when they have good coaches. Kids choose to leave football when they have bad coaches. So I think the biggest thing is who are the coaches developing your child. Who are the football coaches developing your children? Um, man, he's been, he, he's been dynamite on this the last couple of weeks just in terms of like the future in general of football. Um, last week he talked about how we just don't have enough coaches in the sport right now that have played it, right? And, and good coaches, as he just told you right there, impact the, the future essentially of the, the football player. Right? He said good coaches uh, lead to football players sticking around football. Bad coaches lead to football players wanting to leave football. Um, also thought it was interesting to hear him talk about if you're six, hey, maybe let's not have the conversation. If you're 14, we better be super immersed mm -hmm. in it. So if I'm listening to that, which I did again today, um, if my son were ever to ask me to play football, I think it sounds to me like that time period between 12 to 13 we better be building critical skills in the game of football, okay, and teaching him and immersing him or her in the game of football. Um, prior to that, let's just be an athlete. Let, let's just play around. Let's, let's, do, let's play chase. Let's play hide and seek. Let's play multiple sports. Let's do whatever. Um, but when we get to that 10 to 14 year old range, we better be, you know, absolutely hammering down on the skill sets required to be great at the sport we want to be great at. Um, so I thought that was certainly interesting to, to hear from. I know you guys listened to today. Any tidbits from that? I think it is very important that at that young age to make the most important aspect of the game, make it fun. Yeah. Because at that point you get hooked on it and then you build the foundational skills when you're like, because doing all these drills when you're six and seven, one, it's going to take away from the fun. It becomes work. And then it's not really going to do a whole lot for you. Mm -hmm. Like we've seen all the stories of that fourth grader that was insane and then just never grew. So just, just have fun at that age. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's important to find a balance um, I think coaches, of course, play a critical role, but at an early age, finding a balance of like, we're still going to take it serious as we should everything, but at the same time, like, let's not go so far into it that we're going to burn ourselves up by the time we should be making those decisions. I'm, I'm obviously a young parent. I, I think what I've decided on this, and I may change my mind in the next 10 years or whenever this happens, but um, I think about that 10 or 11 age range. Um, I think, first of all, the, the child becomes very aware and very smart. They're smart now, but like, super smart and aware you can have almost adult-like conversations with them and I think at that moment with both my children I'll say like hey is this something we just want to have fun at or is this something we want to maybe potentially pursue in terms of long-term like success and at that point we will address their future ac or athletically a little bit different right we'll be a little bit more critical we'll be a little bit more hard on it because hey like you want to do this and if you want to do this this is what is required to be great at this um but if we just want to be fun, if we just want to have fun, then we'll just have fun, and that's fine too. Um, I don't really care. I'm not. You don't have to pursue. You don't have to push your kids' excellence uh, upon them. You just kind of let them figure it out. I guess that's my opinion. I'd be interested to hear others on that type of discussion. But it was it was interesting for me to hear it come from him today. Um, that 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 time range is important. Hey, to, it sounds to him like hey, ten to fourteen. By fourteen, we better be well immersed and getting after it uh, and being prepared for the physicality of the sport. We better be showing that we, we enjoy the physicality of the sport. He was asked about Roger Robinson. Sounds like he's getting closer to doing some dry land running. Um, it's very interesting to hear. If you keep hearing him repeat uh, phrases, I, I, it sticks out to me like the dry land running and the, and the running underwater and all this stuff. They are very clearly doing uh, weight-based uh, rehab planning with these lower body injuries. I know they've done hyperbaric chambers in years past, not hyperbaric chambers, but the, the anti-gravity chambers in your past and, and treadmills and things like that. So it's very, very neat to me to hear, you know, coaches making sure that they're, uh, you know, training their guys and their guys are staying in condition when, when they're hurt and when they're injured. Um, now, this is the, one of the ones that I wanted to hear about. Obviously, Carson Beck has been playing lights out, uh, completing 72.5% of his balls, 
1,800 yards on this season. Uh, he's fourth in the country in total yardage. So when your quarterback's playing that well, I wanted to know, hey, coach, where can he improve? And this is what he had to say. Growth. Where, where do you want to see Carson Beck continue to improve at the quarterback position in his play specifically? Uh, mobility, um, getting in and out of the pocket, decisions when to tuck it down and run versus uh, stand in and throw. And, um, you know, some design runs probably wouldn't, you know, hurt him around the red area and things that he can do. He's a good athlete. Uh, and and the, the, the one or two plays a game that he puts us at risk, you know, removing that is the most critical thing, decision making. Yeah. Um, how about Kirby? I think the the main takeaway there, we'll talk about at an extensive length here in a second. I think Kirby might have left a little nuggy in there for us to be paying attention to, but his main uh, area of improvement, mobility. Hey, that's what some of we've been talking about on here. That's the last infinity stone. Can you do a little bit of what we saw on Twitter today? Our, our guy Cole Kublik put out the all 22 footage of something we showed you on the film study of him the other day. Thought one of his best plays was the pocket mobility play. Okay, made a guy miss, avoided a rush. Okay, set his feet back down, let a rip and took a hit, right? Um, that was an impressive football play for him and that's something that he's gonna have to continue to improve upon. Also talked about those two or three quote critical mistakes or critical uh, risk plays that he makes uh, in the last couple of football games. Gonna have to eliminate those as well. But the main takeaway right there was that red zone run game. Did you hear that? He said maybe getting in some red zone mobility, using his legs down there, putting in some design run game for the guy to make it a little bit easier in the red zone. Kirby doesn't usually talk about things like that. Um, he, he, he let one not necessarily slip, but he let us get one right there today. Yeah, well, I think I, like, I saw it in the stands on Saturday, and I'm sure they saw it on film that they run inside zone a couple of times. and Dude's just diving in. Well, yeah. I mean, there's there's a couple of plays where I'm like, if Carson keeps that, it's a 20-yard gain no matter what. Even even if he's jogging, it's a 20-yard gain. So I think they're starting to see that on film. They're going to take advantage of it very shortly. Yeah, there's been numerous times where I'm watching the game this season where I'm just like, man, if Carson would just keep one of those and he gets like a 10-yard, 15 game, I think it would help out the offense a lot running wise because then they just have to they have to honor that from now on throughout the football game. You see it once, you have, you therefore have to honor it. Yeah, it's that's exactly it right there. You put it on tape once, and everybody's at least got to act like they care to mm -hmm. to stay there because that's all that really requires that backside end to be a surf player. Because if you rip off one twenty yard gain, yep, I mean that's that's one more explosive in a football game that on the ground typically only provides four or five types of explosive plays like that. So, um, yeah, certainly something that they might be able to add into their bag. He was asked about the disconcerting signals again today. I Man, I, I gave you my spill on that last night. I think that's a, a direct, like, hey, at first it's move, and then by the end of the game it might sound a whole lot like hut. You know what I mean? Like the first couple get passed, and then the last couple get, get got. Um, and if you heard Kirby talk about it today, if you watched the press conference, the full presser, which is available over on Dogs Daily, um, if you watch the full press conference, you hear him talk about how, you know, the, the guys are coached to basically say what they need to say, and what they need to say is per the rules, and they're coached to stay within the rules, but sometimes they go outside the rules is what it sounded like. And that's basically kind of what we hinted on last night when we were talking about this subject, how the move and, and shouting move midway through the game might sound a little bit like hut or might sound a little bit like whatever the opposition snap count is. Um, Seth Emerson was the one asking the question today from The Athletic and mentioned that, uh, you know, a couple of other SEC teams have gotten in trouble for clapping and having yeah. the move. Um, and that's an obvious one, right? Because yeah. most, uh, you know, quarterbacks snap counts nowadays are off the clap. I vividly remember, I don't know if this was a Georgia game or what, I remember watching a couple years ago, the linebacker's making a check, the mic mm -hmm. is making a check, and he's going, screaming at the Will. Will can't hear him. And he claps to get his attention just like that, and they immediately throw a flag on that. So, I mean, that's kind of the most common version of disconcerting signals you've seen. You don't usually see someone mimicking a hike or, but like you said, move, kick, something like that, late in the fourth quarter, you're fatigued. That can kind of sound like hot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. He was asked about Marvin Jones Jr.'s playing time today. Um, and he mentioned that he actually rolled his ankle midweek last week. That was why he had a decrease in playing time this past weekend. And that things should be okay uh, coming up this weekend. He was also asked about Vanderbilt Stadium. And this is, again, we always search for these on this channel. And I think you should for in your day. You should look for these in your daily life as well. The, the obvious signs of, of, of obsessive traits, okay? 
obvious, obvious signs of obsessive traits. Now, this one I'm about to uh, explain to you uh, requires insane resources, <laughs> like stupid ass, just I get to waste money if I want to type of resources, but it's another sign of obsessive traits. Vanderbilt's obviously going through a bunch of stadium renovations, okay, a whole bunch, all right? And it's gonna look ugly if you're going up there in Nashville Saturday. It's not gonna be fun. The, the opposing locker rooms are borderline um, circus tents. Yeah, they are circus tents, but they are also borderline uh, not passable for SEC standards. There's been multiple, multiple complaints per my sourcing across the league about having to play at Vanderbilt this year. Um, and it's been bad in years past. But here's what I'm talking about, all right? Kirby Smart this summer, do you know what he did? He sent, he sent somebody, he sent a staff group up to Vanderbilt to just look around the stadium and just plan out their operations and then come back only to implement and plan those operations six months later. I'm telling you guys, it's, it's, first of all, it's fuck you money. I, I, I have the kind of money to just send guys up to Nashville, guys and gals up to Nashville. Hey, go snoop around, check it out, come back, and we'll plan. Okay, what? What? We sent folks up to Nashville midway through the summer to see how our road trip against Vandy, a team that we should thump by 31 and a half points per Vegas, okay, just to make sure we're prepared. This is what I'm talking about, man. This is why y'all look for signs of differences. There it is right there. Sending a staffer, a group of staffers up there to just check out the stadium. That's insane. Insane. <laughs> Absolutely bonkers. Um, asked about Ra Ra. We're almost done here. Asked about Ra Ra. said, quote, this is a good quote, I thought. Um, and it also basically encapsula encapsulates everything we've said on Patreon up to this point. Patreon.com forward slash Brooks Austin. I love hearing him say things in October that we told you in August, okay? It just it puts a big smile on my face in the middle of the room that nobody knows why I'm grinning like an idiot. Um, here we go. Quote, he's gotten better every week. He probably struggled a lot during spring. He grew a lot during camp. He learned how to work his way through our practices. You've been a Patreon subscriber forever. Didn't we tell you he was having a little problem figuring out how to practice like a Georgia football player? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we told you that back in uh, April, mm -hmm. right, during spring practice. So there you go, bingo. It's all of the world's stuff coming at him. It's all of the stuff in the world coming at him, and that's what he said he wanted to do when he came here. Wanted to learn how to become a complete wideout. Wanted to learn how to play special teams, doing all of those things. Um, now and he's getting really really comfortable hey welcome into tonight's show we got a loaded one for you um, it's going to be a banger of an episode we're going to talk a little bit about what could have been in that week two matchup between georgia and oklahoma they got canceled we obviously obviously have to talk about mark stoops um, does kirby smart kind of dislike vandy we're going to talk a little bit about that apparently and we teased mid-season awards last night we're going to bring them to you tonight um, instead. So make sure you're in that thumbs up button, like, subscribe, and rate and review it. It is a massive, massive time to be here on this network. The growth is through the roof. We didn't talk about it the other night, but hey boys, I think we need to uh, give them three. We have passed over 15,000 subscribers and that is a testament to you guys right there. So we love you. We thank you. If you're already or if you're not already subscribed, make sure you're doing so today. Um, you can also find us over on uh, wherever, however you catch your podcast. Uh, whether it be Spotify, iTunes, all that good stuff. However you listen, you can listen to us over there. If you're watching, make sure you're watching over here on YouTube and hitting that thumbs up button. That's how you show support to this network. I um, want to give a quick shout out to the folks over at Prize Picks. Use the promo code Brooks today. You can get 100% deposit match. What does that mean? You put in up to $100. They will match it instantly as long as you use that promo code, promo code Brooks. And I think my boy Kirby's doing what I think he's doing, um, which is potentially getting set up to go take a look at uh, these. Yeah, look at my boy. Dang, he's good. Hey, head over to the Athletic Collection today, and you can get you one of these fire-ass posters. Look, that's fresh out the box, guys. That's fresh out the box, rolled out the tube, taped right to the curtain behind the dweebs over there, and it looks dope. Okay, the one over there with Brock Bowers looks even sicker. If you head over to the Athletic Collection today, you can get you one. And the best thing about those, guys, they are supportive to the NIL fund, okay, for the University of Georgia. If you buy one of those, you're helping support and put a little money in the pockets of Georgia football players. So make sure you're doing that today. All right, we got all that good stuff. Let's talk about this Mark Stoops dude. Baby, Marky, what are you doing, dog? I have been the king, okay? I don't, I don't know of a single analyst in the world that goes to bat or has gone to bat for Mark Stoopies like your boy, okay? I don't know. I don't know of a single person that's been out here planting flags on Mark Mountain like yours true, 
Okay, I've been out here. I've been out here riding for the Marky boy. All right, but what he did this weekend and what he did yesterday, and it's just, it's bad, all right? Um, I was the first one to tell y'all that did y'all know Kentucky and Mark Stoops have a bowl, a uh, consecutive bowl streak longer than Tennessee, longer than Texas, longer than Ole Miss, longer than Florida? Like, Mark Stoops is a good football coach, but sometimes – he just says some stuff that I don't really understand. Let's play this clip. This clip comes via courtesy of the UK show. Um, this is a Kentucky branded sports show. This is Mark Stoops weekly radio show that I would presume he asked out of after the response from today's clip. You know, the, the other side, if you want to do that, it's plain complain, deny or make excuses. And we're not going to do that. You know, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, fans have that right. I, I give it to him and, you know, I just encourage him to donate more because that's what those teams are doing. And, and, uh, in, uh, yeah, I could promise you in Georgia, they, they bought some pretty good players. You're allowed to these days and, uh, we could use some help. That's what they look like. You know what I mean? When you have 85 of them. So, so, uh, uh I encourage, uh, anybody that's disgruntled to, to pony up some more. All right. So quick reactions right here. First of all, um, rule number one, after receiving the worst SEC loss in a fat minute in this conference, don't blame your talent discrepancy. It just makes you look really, really sour. And also, your players probably don't love it. Rule number two, don't tell your fan base that's pissed off because you just received one of the worst beatings in SEC history um, to, quote, pony up some more bread and basically call them broke and essentially tell them that, hey, our talent discrepancy is because we don't have enough cash. That's probably not good. Rule number three, don't you say a dare a, a crossword one about another football coach? That's like that's like the ultimate golden rule. It's like the unwritten rule of football coaching. You don't say anything cross about the other guy. You just don't. Kirby followed up today. We're gonna play you the clip, and then we're gonna get to Terrence. Kirby followed up today the exact way head football coaches to, should. Rule number four, and perhaps the most important rule: if we're gonna say something like this that will ultimately go viral. Can we not be a slumped over, like, slouch stooch, stooch of a man? Can we at least, like, sit up? Can we look presentable? Because even though it's a radio segment, Coach, it's this thing called simulcast, which means they're also taking the audio and the video, and they're putting it out for public viewing. So can we at least look presentable when we come out here with some wild-ass takes? I'm going to get you guys' response on this after we talk to Terrence because I don't want to get Terrence held up too much. But please play for the audience Kirby's response to the uh, quote from Mark Stoops today because um, it's pretty wild. All right. Mark Stoops was talking about NIL yesterday. I'm not sure if you heard about those comments. Um, he said, I, I can promise you, Georgia, they bought some pretty good players. You're allowed to these days. We could use some help. Is that a fair assessment? What's your reaction to that? No reaction. Just uh, much to do about nothing, really. I mean, I think Mark's trying to garner uh, interest in, 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 you know, money from his fan base for his collective, and we're all trying to do the same in terms of trying to get money for our collective. I don't. I mean, Mark and I talked about NIL pregame, and uh, we talk about it in our meetings. So I'm not. I'm not biting on that. Yeah, I'm not biting on that. And the last, the last sentence right there is exactly the way I expected him to. Let's save the thoughts, reactions. Uh, you guys in the chat, go ahead and fire off your thoughts on the Mark Stoops comments. Um, but I want to go ahead and bring in legendary Terrence Edwards. Who that boy, Terrence? That boy, Terrence got two shout outs on the television broadcast the other day. My boy, Te, out here spreading the brand and spreading the love. How we doing today, brother? Man, I'm doing fine, man. How about yourself? I loved your little gif, the, 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 how I'm walking around the house after they mentioned my name on the television broadcast. That was, that was oh, funny. Oh, right. You, you know, I heard, heard it twice, so <laughs> I had to strut my stuff a little bit. I don't do it very often, so just had to find a little gift. I was like, man, I, I heard my name. Hey, is the youngest Edwards, like, is he, is he old enough to understand what daddy was in those moments? Like, when that happens, is he old enough to understand how cool that is? Yeah, see, if you saw a tweet that I tweeted about a month ago, he Googled my name and he found some stuff on me and he's like, man, you got all these records, you in the top and this, top that. So it's it's pretty cool when your son sees you just a text out the blue saying, no, you, you was kind of a badass. <laughs> you was kind of that guy. Um, yes, yes, I was. <laughs> uh, it's Vandy Week for the University of Georgia, obviously, Terrence. Um, I'm curious, what, what was Vanderbilt like when you were playing there? When you were at the University of Georgia, what was Vandy Week like, and, and has anything really changed? 
Did you see that the, the pass forty four? I forgot what it's called with David Green. The pass fake. I, we we just worked on that and worked on that. And Vandy Week was the right week to call it. Uh, Coach Rick and Coach Bobo called it at the right at that time. But I'll be honest with you, it wasn't one of those weeks where we're like we're going to just be a stat game. It wasn't what really? we thought we were going to just be a stat game. We knew that Vandy always had great defenses. Um, and had really good offense, so we never thought it was a a stat week. It was another SEC game, another game that we had to win to reach our ultimate goal. Yeah, I think that just after you, I think Murray would be the one to ask this question because I think he played against Jordan Rogers when they were actually really, really good under Derrick Mason. Yeah, he lost or actually, to him excuse in me, uh, under James Franklin and all those guys. So maybe that's a question we need to ask for Murray one time about these Vandy Commodores. Um, but you obviously would have played a road game there, Terrence, maybe even two. Um, did it ever feel like a road game? What was your, what was your you know, impressions on playing in Nashville up there at that stadium? Because it's under a tremendous amount of renovations right now. Right. It's, uh, it's probably not one of, the, you know, one of the smallest stadiums in the SEC. And uh, Nashville is not that far away. So the, the dog faithful and the dog nation really showed up. Um, not not very loud. So, but you you got to go in and, and kind of get your own juices flowing. I remember when the uh, the targeting rule first came about, and we went up there and lost because I think we had a, a crucial targeting penalty, which was mm. not a targeting penalty, and we lost. Um, so, it's another game that these guys understand that they have to win to kind of achieve the goal of winning the East first. Uh, Clinton the East and get an opportunity to play in the uh, SEC championship game. So I just think this team is mature enough to know that this game is just as important as the Kentucky game, the Florida game, and the Tennessee game. Terrence, a fake sneak, uh, a fake uh, bubble screen with a tunnel action behind it, uh, a third down shot play where we tight end leak, the best tight end in all of college football history. Mike Bobo was in his ever-loving bag on Saturday night, was he not? Hashtag fire Mike Bobo. That, 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 that is that is my mantra on Twitter. That's I'm a, I'm gonna continue to just during the games. Just gonna just say you know just funny stuff to keep it light. But Bobo is he's been that way this this whole season. I, I think I think the execution has gotten better in each game. I mm -hmm. think players have gotten healthier in each game, and you can see. I mean when 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 Bobo is dialing it up like that, and Carson Beck. Is, is just dotting and throwing dimes to all the receivers and all the playmakers. That's what's going to happen. You know, when, when those guys do not play um, well and play up to their ability, those plays is not going to happen. So I think it's, it was a, a 12 man um, execution. And I say 12, that's, that's the, the players, 11 players on the field and Mike Bobo in the booth. Absolutely. Hey, you, you mentioned some of those weapons, some of those wide receivers. Take Brock Bowers out of it. I know everyone kind of overanalyzes how great he is, if that's even possible to do. Um, what wide receivers really stood out to you Saturday? Because um, I think there are some guys, man, that are really working their way into maybe a, a feature and primary role. Man, my guy, I tweeted about uh, Marcus, and uh, that's that's one of my guys that I talk to all the time when I went down. So I'm not going to – I've gained him love over Twitter this week. I call him the heartbeat of the team. I think he's the heart and soul. Uh, he's a guy that's very unselfish. But – a guy that's coming to his own that the dog nation just uh, was looking to to have that breakout game is Rod Rod Thomas. Each week he's gotten better and better and more comfortable and more comfortable. He's playing more and more, and he showed why we went out in the portal and when it got him. Man, I think both Porter guys are, is playing a part in this yeah. offense. And I, I, I you know, uh, Dominique haven't had that really breakout game, but he's been important. But Ra Ra with that catch last week showed that he's got the big play ability in, in his arsenal. He's going to be a guy that we're going to count on, on down the line to make big plays. You know, it was interesting to talk to Carson this week about some of those guys and, and about his play in general and just say, man, like, hey, how, how you know, how, what, what's been the biggest key to your success in terms of your accuracy, right? Completing almost 73% of your balls. And his answer basically was my continuity with my wide receivers and how that has still room to grow because we're still trying to figure each other out. I thought this week was an obvious sign of, okay, Carson and Ra Ra have figured out, it, particularly the back shoulder fade. And, and Terrence, I, I'd love you to expound upon this a little bit, but I've heard Kirby talk about it for years, how it really simplifies offense when we have a guy at the, particularly the X position 
that can really like win his one-on-one -on -one and win these types of back shoulder balls on third and like seven plus, third and long, uh, if you will. It makes offense really, really simple when you have a guy like that, does it not? Oh, most definitely. When you got a guy that on money down, that's third down, and mm -hmm. that you could call a play uh, uh, or a off script play that you know I'm just gonna get the guy this ball. I'm gonna give him an opportunity. He's going to win uh, more than not. George Pickett was that way. Um, I was that way. So that exposition is a position that should kind of be your number one receiver. And Ra Ra is a guy that he's legit six two. Um, you saw how he high pointed that ball the other night. There's a lot of receivers that just can't go up and be able to go up with their hands over their head, get their eyes over their head, and concentrate with a guy all over them and still get his get his foot down. And that's exactly what he's done. And he's shown and he's continued to grow in this offense as the big play guy. I think Dominic is our screen guy. And people talk about Bobo throwing screens a lot. Man, if we throw screens and we get eight yards with Dominic, I'm throwing screens every play because that's going to lead to first down and and time of possession. So I don't know what we're crying about, about throwing screens when it's getting you eight yards of pop. So Terrence, you know, those, guys, those guys have got into their roles, uh, and I love it. No, it's so funny. Like, obviously, we do a bunch of film stuff here. And when I when I just pause the screen, everyone on Twitter loves to do the, the screen captures where they just pause the screen and take a, a photo of it. If you go look at their some of their throws to Dom to start the football game and some of those those bubble screens where they got a corner that's flexed off nine yards and a safety that's flexed off of Dom at the, as a number two receiver at like 12 yards. If you just screenshot it right as Dom touches the football, Ra Ra Thomas is like four yards down the field engaged with the corner and nobody's in the picture within like 12 <laughs> yards. OK, and if you're going to tell me that's what football might be on that play. Dude, we're going to design up that every single time as a coordinator because we should have six, seven-yard gains on that. And guess what? That's exactly what it's been, or that's exactly what it was Saturday. So I'm right with, I'm right there with you. Like, you don't have to make football so complicated, right? We, right. we can just play two over two over there if they want us to instead of playing eight versus seven right here in this here box. Um, I'm right there with you. Um, has, we're midway through the season, Terrence. Um, has Georgia lived up to whatever expectations you had for him coming into the season? Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I just think a lot of people, because we are the national champs, we're the back-to-back the -back national champs, and we are uh, we're a very talented team, but we are not the same team from the last two years. And if you saw what Jalen Carter did to our beloved Matthew Stafford this week, and you understand why the run game is not – as elite as it been, we're very good, but we're not elite as we've been in the past. 88, number three, those guys are in the NFL. You saw Quay Walker last night. Mm -hmm. He's in the NFL. So those guys are playing and making millions of dollars um, because they're talented <laughs> dictate that. So, yes, we have some talented guys, but those other guys were special. That's why there's first-round picks, and we got to do it as a collective effort, as you always hear Kirby say. But we don't have that guy right now who can take over the game in the front seven like uh, like a uh, Jalen Carter, like a Jordan Davis, like a Nolan Smith, like a N'Kobe Dean, like a Quay Walker. We have very good players, but we don't have those players right now uh, that's playing significant minutes. So I'm right. I think we're right where we want to be. And what I have seen is we've gotten better each weekend. That's what you want to see out your football team. You're 100% right. I think, well, in this sense, I think that, most of your game breakers, the guys that make plays and impact games and sudden change the football game, um, they play defensive back for you right now. It's guys like Javon Bullard, guys like Malachi Starks that really impact games in sudden change moments. Um, when you're right, second and three last year got turned in third and seven pretty daggum often because 88 was making TFLs in the background. He is Terrence Edwards. He is currently the all-time leading receiver at the University of Georgia for now. We will see what happens with Brock Bowers this, <laughs> this, this year. Hey, Terrence, man, I can't, I can't thank you enough for coming on every single week, man. I appreciate you, brother. Man, no problem. We'll talk to you next week. Um, make sure you're following Terrence on Twitter. He's at TE Wide Receiver Academy. 
Um, and if we, we talked about Kirby and, and, and his advice for young athletes across the game of football nowadays, if you're a young skill position player, okay, whether it be a tight end, wide receiver, uh, maybe even a running back that needs some skill set uh, management outside of the game of just running the football, and even then his brother Robert might be able to help you over there at the bubble. Contact Terrence and get into contact with him for some of his training. He does some of the best uh, individual training uh, in the Atlanta area. We still have a whole bunch to go throughout this show. We got to hit these midseason awards right meow. Uh, we got MVP, the most improved player, the Tundra Award, okay? You can call this the F-150. You can call this the Silverado, whatever your preference is. This is the football or the portion of the football team that needs to, quote, pick it up. Um, and then we have our biggest surprise category as well. Boys, we'll start as a unison. MVP on three. One, two, three. Brock, Brock Bowers. Bowers. All right, let's start with most improved with the real analysis. We'll go around the room. Do we have some, some multi-selections? What do you got going on? I have Oscar Delp, me Ooh. personally, as most improved. Not that Me likey. I, just from what he did from the end of last season to now and how he continues to get better fish, every single week. Fish thrown in big, deep water against Ohio State. Like little, little puppet goldfish out there, 230 pounds, trying to figure it out against Zach Harrison and uh, Jack Sawyer and JT2 on Malowow and just like, hey, biggest game of your freaking life. Go figure it out, son. You are 100% correct, and this is a good selection in the sense that there hasn't been a ton of improvement in season. There's been some incremental improvement, but not like drastic, um, but there has been a drastic improvement from December 31st, December 31st to what we are doing right now, October 10th. So I'm, I'm on 100% uh, approval of that selection right there. What do you got for me, Curb? So I've got two, but I'm going to pick the one that I know you're not going to pick. Hell yeah. So Thank I'll, you for making me easy. Make my job easy right I'll, here. I'll go Cash Jones. I think if you <laughs> if you have told people at the end of last year he was going to be your RB1 for a good portion of the season, not a lot of people would believe you. And he's looked good. He's done a relatively good job doing it. Yeah. So I'll give him the most improved role. He saved you for, for the first two or three games. Now, it's lucky the schedule was light. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Dejon Edwards not only spraining a knee, but Kendall Milton getting off to a slow start with a hamstring and then having a sprained knee himself. Um, that room was pretty banged up. Obviously, Branson Robinson going out. Um, yeah, the, the addition via a PWO of Cash Jones has paid major, major dividends for this football program. Make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button, like, subscribe, and rate, and review, and all that good stuff. Um, my most improved, I think we just hit on it with Terrence, um, in season, okay, from week one to where we are right now, there, I don't think there has been a bigger improvement um, than what Ron Rod Thomas has been able to do from a, you know, hey, he's the number two X receiver to start the season. Hell, maybe even number three if you really check their rotations week one and week two to now suddenly being like, all right, it's pretty clear this might be the guy at the X position. Marcus Rosimi, Jack Saints, a great – you have a great one-two punch right now is what it's looking like. Um, and that is a way different story than where you were last year. Mm -hmm. Last year it was, okay, Adonai Mitchell is a great 50-50 ball catcher. Okay, well, he shows up in big moments of the football game. We might be able to find Marcus Rosimi, Jack Saint on a dig every once in a while. But there was not a consistent, this guy's going to win – uh, on that Georgia roster, and it looks like you might have an opportunity for a potential of two, at least two guys that your quarterback very clearly feels comfortable putting into a situation like that. Um, and I think that is certainly an improvement for this football team. Tundra, what do you got? Who needs to pick it up? You know, it's so hard, honestly, especially after the Kentucky game, because I think a lot of people would have said the offensive line, but the offensive line certainly proved something on Saturday against Kentucky. So I think it's kind of hard to pick just one singular group now, but I guess if I... I learned, hold on, I don't mean to do this to you, but I learned that there's not too much to bitch about on this football team when we went to the streets in Athens Saturday night after the game. Now, I know everybody's kind of hammered or intoxicated or whatever, but when you ask the common fan, hey, where are your complaints? They go, uh... That's a good time to be a Georgia Bulldog fan, you know what I mean? Like, that, that's not bad. So when we do this pickup segment... Just understand, we're really it's, – it's, it's ought to be called nitpick up and all right, because we're really nitpicking here. Sorry. I guess the only thing that I could really say is maybe maybe some other guys on the defensive line to kind of mm. show out a little bit more. Like, gave some love to Warren Brinson, rightfully so. Nazir Stackhouse, Zion Logue, Michael Williams, all those guys. Maybe a Marvin Jones start flashing once he gets healthy or someone else on the edge. Just something like that if we're going to You gonna need wild plays. Yeah. You need breakout plays, and I'm with you. That needs to be picked up. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but go ahead. 
This one is also very nitpicky, but I said the linebacker core. Mm. You look at the linebackers the last Better game two, this past week. Yeah, mm -hmm. much. But, they've yep. gotten better the last two weeks, but you look at the guys where you've had the last two seasons where it felt like every year someone was competing for the Butkus Award, and you don't have that as much now. It's not that they're playing bad, but I don't think they're playing to the elite standard, the sideline to sideline, filling gaps that they were the past two years. So I think there's room to improve on that. You know, it's funny. We're going to go three for three here, defensive side of the football, pick it up. There's no effing way. There's no effing way you could have told me that in August. I'm like, hey, midway through the year, Georgia's offense is going to look absolutely stellar. Like the only questions are going to be, are you top end elite at the running back position? Are you top end elite as an offensive line? Like, are you versatile? Um, but other than that, y'all are going to just absolutely score at will. Your quarterback's going to look insane. Um, defensively, all the questions are going to be. And my question um, is the defensive backfield for this reason. There's just a couple runners. Okay, there's so a, a couple of free runners every single game. Now, do you get hit on them every single game? No. Is this a byproduct of college football? Yes. Is it fearful when you have Tennessee and Missouri still on the schedule? Yeah. Yeah. You know who are two offenses that are really good at designing free runners? Those two guys. All right, so um, if, you, if it's not 100% cleaned up, expect explosives to happen moving down throughout the year um, or throughout the season, I should say. Um, apart from that, how about turnovers? How about turnovers defensively? You know they've yeah. only created one fumble and they didn't even recover it. Okay, Georgia has not punched – this is something Kirby talked about today. Georgia has not punched the football out but once this season, and it was David Daniel doing it. So that is something that they have implemented a new scoring system apparently during practice. I know you guys heard this today, where every single time during the game that you are seen punching, stabbing, ripping at the football, you are awarded a point, and we're trying to score the most points on the defensive side of the football. So, hey, Havoc plays outside of making sure you're covering everybody up and everybody's blanketed up out there on the defensive side of the football. Those are the areas of improvement I'd like to see. All right. Biggest surprise of the year, gentlemen. What are we going with? I just mentioned him. Warren Brinson to me is the biggest surprise. I think you need someone to step up. I think a lot of people were looking at Nazir Stackhouse to kind of be that guy. And now Warren Brinson, it seems like every time you watch him on the football field, he's in the backfield. He's making some of those wild plays that you just mentioned. And he's been a massive surprise to me. I love it. I what had two, but I'm going to pick the one I know you're not going to do. So, I've got Xavier Truss. Yeah. I don't think anyone had him playing Shots right. Shouts out Rhode Island. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone had him playing right tackle for the season. Obviously, it's because of an injury, but you could argue he's played better at right tackle than he has a guard position. I so. wouldn't I wouldn't argue it. I'd say it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's surprising to say that. So It is a little surprising to say that. Shouts out Rhode Island. He's As, bigger than the whole state. Bro, he is. He is obviously the best football player to ever come out of the state of Rhode Island. Has to be. Um, I looked it up. He is. He's okay. the highest ranked player to ever come out of Rhode Island. <laughs> I was trying to um, think. But. but, no, I asked Kirby about it the other day, and he was like, no, nah, don't remember much about it. He swears by the region and that it's good football. But, um, no, he is certainly the only player we've ever recruited out of the state of Rhode Island. So, shouts out R.I. Um, all the way up there. Just mm -hmm. way up there. Couldn't point it out on a map. It's so mm -hmm. little. Yeah. Um, so, shouts out Rhode Island. Shouts out Xavier Trust. He has been a pleasant surprise. Um, I was disappointed in the guard play. It's what I, I wanted to ask him today. I just know he was going to swap me down like fucking Matumbo in the 90s and give me one of them uh -uh's. All right. I was going to ask him, hey, when Amarius comes back, what the hell are you going to do at left guard? Because Dylan Fairchild's playing his ass off right now. You turn the tape on. Tell me 53 ain't playing great. Because he's playing great. And guess who else is starting to turn, turn, turn a leaf and play great as well? Micah Morris. All right, so when Amarius Mims come back, do you take the sixth-year tackle who's about to go into the NFL, who I've been on this network saying is an NFL football player in the form of Xavier, Xavier Trust, and do you not play him? Do you spot play him at tackle? Do you put him back at left guard and, and start him because he's the sixth-year senior, even though Dylan Fairchild and Micah Morris are starting to play great? Guys, I'm telling you right now, there is going to be a mean, mean, critical decision in that room in about two and a half weeks, okay, when Amarius comes back. Because there's no way you can keep Amarius Mims off the field. That's a non-negotiable. So what are you going to do? you got to rotate three or four guys at, 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 four, at two positions, okay? Um, which is weird because I, I haven't seen Micah. We, we know Micah can rep at right guard. We know Dylan can rep at, rep, le, at right guard. But they've both been playing left guards during this time that Xavier's been out at right tackle. So, uh, bottom line, it's a decision. It's a, it's, a, it's a rich man's problem, okay? It's something that you guys have an issue with and not a lot of football teams in the country have. Their problem a lot, around, a lot of times around college football is, do we have five good ones? 
you got about seven good ones, uh, potentially eight, uh, when, when everybody is healthy. So, yeah, Xavier Trust 100% has been a pleasant surprise. But the biggest surprise, and I know I, you guys left this for me, and we decided these yesterday as a unit, and now it made us do it as a, as a collective, as individuals. Um, but Dylan Bell has been a, a tremendous surprise for this football team with regards to his ability to play the running back position and stabilize a unit that needed some serious stabilization. So, shouts out to him for that right there. All right, now, hey. 69 thumbs ups right now. 69 nice. likes nice. Nice. over there in the chat. Let's make it 70. Hell, let's make it 170. I know there's a bunch of people watching right now, so make sure you're doing it. All right. There's a bunch of people watching, and there's a bunch of people watching that are about to watch me get super, super nerdy about football. What? I was going to say, we haven't gone back to that Mark Stoops column, but oh. he's really itching to give this. Oh, you, you, you got some dumps on Mark I Stoops? I don't hate it. You don't hate it? I don't hate it. Why? Because I don't think it was. I don't. I don't hate it. Other than you took a stab at a coach. Other than that, tell me why. I don't, you don't even know hate if it. he took a stab at a coach. Because if you look at it back when the Jimbo and Saban thing went down, where Saban was like, "Yeah, you know, they bought their players, but we're not doing that." That's not what Mark Stoops said. He said, "Yeah, they went out and got players with NIL. That's what we want to do. That's what we need if our program is going to compete with these upper F echelons." Keep in mind, you've got Oklahoma and Texas coming into the conference next year. So he knows that he's going to have to get better players. That's what he's calling out for, I think. Say it like that, Mark. That's all you had to do. If you said it like that, nobody would be up your ass today. Yeah. But you didn't say it like that. It's how you say things. It's not what you say all the time. Um, let's get after this. I, I, I got, some, got some dope, dope shit here. All right. So, first of all, I think – give me the wide shot because we're going to get really, really uh, nerdy here. And I know we might go over time. It's okay. Here now – Say what? Yeah, no, no, no. Oh, we, we got one. Um, just a couple of pelotas sitting around here. Now, I think there are two types of throwers in the game of football. I think there are linear throwers, okay, guys that really, like, lean over. If you drew a straight line from the ball to their front point, they are linear throwers, okay? Now, I also think there are rotational throwers, guys that every time they throw, their shoulders at a parallel, Okay, their spinal uh, column is in perfect tact, right? Right now, you could draw a line right down the zipper of their body. Okay, every single time they throw, their shoulders are square. Now, the University of Georgia, I believe, has one rotational thrower, one linear thrower, and a guy in Gunnar Stockton that I don't know yet because we haven't seen a large sample size of them. But I'm going to show you a bunch of photos today. I'm going to go through this whole rigmarole about how there's linear throwers and there are rotational throwers. And the bottom line, before I get into any of this, is to tell you that there is ways to have success in both of these, okay? There is not a preferred method, even though I think there is a preferred method, and the greatest guy to ever play the position has chosen a preferred method. However, there are great football players doing both of these things, and I think we've shown you on this channel that quarterback play is far more about processing and making the right decision than it is about how well you throw the football. However, your mechanics will lead to consistencies or inconsistencies. Everybody ready? Linear, rotational. Here we go, let me show you the difference. Now, here is your starting quarterback at the University of Georgia. Can you give me Epic Pin somehow? Actually, let me try it right here. Um, type in on the, on the uh, yeah, type Shit, in Epic Pin over there. Anyways, so here we go. Check out here. The front hip right here is pulled back. We've rotated, all right? The shoulders are square. We're on the side of this football. Our fingers are, are, are on the side and edge of this ball, right? We could draw a line straight down the middle of our body. We got a little bend in our front knee, okay? You see how the back hip is back? The, the, uh, the or excuse me, the front hip is rotating back. The, the back hip is rotating forward. We got this pivoting, okay? This rotational energy around the center line of our body, right? That is what rotational throwers look like, all right? Now, that is what a rotational thrower looks like. Let's show you what a linear thrower looks like. All right, I told you, linear throwers, we can draw a straight line, not down the middle of their body, not down the core of their body, but from that front toe, okay, through that release point of that football. Okay, that is what a linear, a linear thrower looks like. Now, what you will notice is, Somebody called it a reverse uh, abdomen crunch. One of those, you know, one of those kind of lean, whatever you call that, pulling down the, uh, what is this, your, your oblique, oblique, right? An oblique crunch, right? That's what it kind of looks like. Yes, 100%. All right, what this also leads to is really, really uh, uh, violent throwers of the football. Ball jumps right out of the hand, okay? It's heavy all the time. Really can cut through the wind. Can do all of those physical, throw it 100 mile an hour, pull down the shade type of football throws. Now, 
Here's the deal. Hey, Brooks, who are some historical examples of these guys? And what does it matter? Well, here's the deal, okay? So that's a linear thrower. We just showed you that. Let me show you another one. This is one of the greatest linear throwers of all time. Probably the greatest linear thrower of all time. There is that line right through that body, okay? Right through that left foot, right onto that, that, that kind of lean over the torso, right? You kind of see how we're leaning over that line through the ball down through our foot. Okay, that is a linear thrower. Okay, some of these older school guys, they're super linear throwers, right? Look at Tom Brady back in the day. This is before he left New England. Okay, we can do the same thing. We can draw that linear line, right? We're kind of leaning back over this football. We're kind of leaning back into this front side, right? All right, now Tom Brady, I love using him as an example for young quarterbacks because he is the greatest of all time. We all agree that, right? And he decided about, I don't know, 19 years through his career, I'm going to go from being a linear thrower of the football to now becoming a rotational thrower of the football because I think it provides a more, you know, successful path, I would imagine. It's a more repetable path, okay? Every single time I throw the football, my shoulders are perpendicular to my spinal column. I am rotating right around the middle of my body, right? My front hip is pulling back. My back hip is pushing forward. I am rotating around the core and the spinal column, all right? Now, here's the best example of this, guys, okay? There are still examples in the league nowadays of linear throwers, right? I didn't show you too many young guys. Kirk Cousins leading the league right now in passing being a linear thrower, right? We see that lean back on his body. That almost looks identical to our guy, Brock Vandergriff. Now, some will say, hey, question for the room. Who is the greatest quarterback in professional football right now? Who's the greatest quarterback in the world? Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes. Let's take a look at it. Look, give, me, give me the Google search over here of Patrick Mahomes. We didn't even bring you a singular photo of Patrick Mahomes. We just bringing you the Google Sleet or the Google Slate. Look at this shit. Every single time man's throws, look how square the damn shoulders are. Look at this. Every single time, square shoulders, square shoulders, square shoulders, square shoulders on a deep ball warming up. How about this one? This was my favorite one down here. Where's him diving? Square shoulders on him diving. Square shoulders on him leaning. He's leaning right, square shoulders. Okay, so how do we become an elite rotational thrower? Well, we got to squat down. We got to sit down on it. That's my opinion, okay? Here's the deal. Give me back to one as y'all get that booty shot. How about that? Okay, we're leaning like this. We're really prone to rip the ball down. We're going to miss with that nose down on that football a lot, okay? The best way I can explain this, get into some judo or get into some mixed martial arts, learn how to throw a, front, a, a leading jab, right? If we can learn how to do this, if we can learn how to rotate our core, my boy Rudy shouts out congratulations on your wedding, by the way, taught me this about throwing the football. If I can throw a jab properly, and if I can rotate my, my lower body, if I can do this and keep my core tight, and I can rotate on that spinal column, I'm gonna release as much possible energy at the end of that jab as humanly possible. Same thing with throwing a football. Okay, throwing a football, hitting a baseball, hitting a golf ball, throwing a punch. They're all identical in this standpoint. The only thing that allows us to produce force is our feet attached to the ground. It's literal ground force. That's the only way we can produce energy from the ground. It's the only thing we're attached to. So however I rotate my core, however I produce that ground force from the feet up, that's going to result in how accurate and how explosive I'm ultimately going to be at the release point of that energy. We all got it? Damn, I got super nerdy. Was that, did that make any sense at all for someone who doesn't know a lot about what I'm talking about? Yeah. Hope so. Hey, hope you guys enjoyed it. Make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button, like, subscribe, rate, and review. I love you. We'll see you in about five minutes.